fluffy snow was falling. The spirit of celebration filled the air, and it seemed that even the sky smelled of tangerines and a Christmas tree. People went about their business with a smile on their faces. Everyone had a New Year's mood. Mark was looking forward to the New Year and was already imagining how he would open the presents in a couple of days. A strange noise resounded on the roof, as if the neighbors were doing repairs. Mark was surprised because he lived in a private house. The knock rang out again, but this time behind the wall. He thought it must have been his classmates joking and decided to run out into the street. Mark noticed large footprints in the snow, quickly returned home and shut the door. The light blinked. The terrible noise and the heavy footsteps were heard. Mark managed to hide under his bed when someone entered his room and quickly called his name. The poor boy could hardly hold his tears in fear. The stranger viciously smashed the computer and left the room. After a while, Mark crawled out from under his bed. Everything at home was ruined. The Christmas tree was broken, while gifts and the New Year's decorations just disappeared. The bell rang at the police station. Steve was on duty. He heard the teenager's plaintive cries on the phone. Together with his partner Bob, they drove to the crime scene. Mark told them that it was unclear how the thief got inside the house. The doors and windows were closed. The policeman investigated the crime scene, pulled the fingerprints and collected some pieces of dirt from the floor for examination. The next day, Mark went to school. He told his classmates what happened to him, and everyone felt sorry and tried to support him, except for one stupid girl. Mark was left without his gift and a Christmas tree on New Year's Eve. This wasn't something to wish even to the enemy. The lesson began. The guys listened to the teacher attentively, but suddenly Mark heard that exact same knock. He pushed Tom, his desk neighbor, but the boy said that he heard nothing but the teacher. The lecturer kicked them both out into the corridor for talking in class. Mark heard the sound from the school toilet yet again and asked his friend to come with him to check who was knocking. But the toilet was completely empty. The boy saw an inscription on the wall. Tom suggested that his classmates decided to joke at him, but Mark insisted that it was the maniac who pursued him. When the classes were finished, they both went to Mark's place. Tom decided to support his friend and stay with him until his parents would return back home. They didn't know how to occupy themselves. The computer was broken, while the TV was displaying some boring news, as usually. Tom suggested to play on their phones and Mark instantly supported the idea, and they had a great time together. Finally, Mark's parents arrived. He sighed with relief, feeling safe. The police officer Steve was having a dinner with his family. They were discussing what they would give to their daughter Eve as a Christmas present, but a sudden phone call interrupted this ideal. It was Bob calling. He said that a teenager was kidnapped from their side. Steve said goodbye to his family and went to work. At the crime scene, he saw that all the gifts were stolen and the Christmas tree was completely destroyed. Everything looked exactly like at Mark's house, but apparently Mark was lucky hiding behind his bed. The dirt from boots was left on the floor, and the snow footprints near the house had the same size. The policeman checked the windows and doors. Everything was intact. The cops couldn't understand how the criminal entered the house. Steve decided to ask the neighbors if they saw someone. The granny who lived across the street said that she saw a hearse, the one that usually carried the coffins, parked near the house. A headless man came out of that hearse. She instantly got scared and closed the curtains. Steve thought that the old lady had definitely gone nuts. Which hearse? No one had died in Roblox for a long time already, and the cemetery was closed since the grave digger passed away. And a headless man? What a heresy! The officers returned to the police station and started investigating the kidnapping case. Suddenly the phone rang, and Steve calmly picked it up, but the girl's screeching made him feel nervous. She was begging for help. Someone was knocking on her door, and she was frightened. They were told about this tuk-tuk at school today, and she thought that he came to kidnap her. Steve asked the girl to hide under the bed. He called Bob and they both went to the scene. The door of the house was locked. Steve had to shoot into the lock to get inside. But there was no maniac inside the house. This weird girl said that 
Apparently, she had confused this knock with someone else. The cops got very disappointed. It seemed that the girl was just kidding. It was getting quite late. Bob went to the police station on his night shift, and Steve returned home to his family. He put his daughter to bed and went to sleep himself. He closed his eyes and almost fell asleep, when suddenly his phone rang. Bob said that this weird girl, Charlotte, called at the police station again and said that this time Tuk Tuk came to kidnap her for real. Both policemen laughed at this, and Bob decided not to respond to this fake call. But in fact, Tuk Tuk really came to Charlotte. She heard the knocking and ran around the house in panic searching for a place to hide. She heard some scary noises and Tuk Tuk's footsteps. Charlotte grabbed a knife and crawled under the table. She heard how Tuk Tuk ruined the Christmas tree and stole all the New Year's toys. Charlotte started to cry. She was worried about her presents that were left under the broken tree. Tuk Tuk heard her whimper and ran into the kitchen. Charlotte screamed and decisively stabbed his leg with a knife, but Tuk Tuk didn't seem to feel it at all. He tied the poor girl up and began to shove her into the chimney along with other presents. The police found out that Charlotte had actually been kidnapped by a maniac only the next morning. Steve and Bob blamed themselves for this and vowed to find the criminal. Mark was walking from school, constantly turning back. It seemed to him that Tuk Tuk was following him every step. At home he decided to find a way to protect himself somehow from the maniac. Having rummaged through his grandfather's old trash, Mark found all the necessary things for a proper self-defense. He set up the signal banners all around the house, mounted cameras for video surveillance and fixed a powerful searchlight on the pole. It was already dark outside, but the Tuk Tuk didn't appear. Mark gradually relaxed and dozed off, but suddenly the signal bell rang. Mark rushed to the monitors and saw someone near the house. The stranger took out the hammer and started knocking on the walls. Mark reached for the phone, but accidentally dropped it. Tuk Tuk started climbing into the roof, went closer to the chimney and was about to get inside. Mark understood how the maniac got into the houses. He ran to the fireplace and began tossing up the woods and pouring oil into the fire. The flame began to burst out of the chimney and Tuk Tuk couldn't climb inside the red hot metal pipe. Mark turned on the spotlight and scared the maniac away. The criminal got inside the heroes and disappeared. Bob and Steve were getting ready to capture the maniac. They trained their muscles and practiced blows on the punching bag. Fiercely, they shot the target, pretending that it was Tuk Tuk. A disheveled Mark ran in the training room, carrying the footage from the security cameras. Delighted, cops started watching the video, but unfortunately, the face of the criminal was not quite visible. At least now, they knew how Tuk Tuk got inside into the houses. The cops were certain that a maniac would definitely return to kidnap Mark. That's why they decided to go into the house altogether. They set a trap in the fireplace and started to wait. When a knock on the door resounded, the cops got nervous. After another knock, Steve couldn't withstand. His finger flinched suddenly and he fired. The cops rushed out into the street. Surprisingly, that mad granny laid right in front of them. Steve realized that he screwed it up and offered Bob to throw her a knife as if she wanted to attack them. But Bob refused to be an accomplice in the murder and reported the incident to the department. Steve didn't want to go to jail, so he took out a shocker, knocked out his partner and disappeared. Mark ran to the policeman and started shaking him. The poor man barely opened his eyes after a powerful electric discharge. Meanwhile, the SWAT group had arrived. Bob told them about the incident and they departed to catch Steve. An interception plan was arranged in the city. The patrols were assigned at every intersection, and the passersby's documents were checked. Armed men in the dark mask burst into Steve's house and started their raid. Steve's wife and daughter sobbed bitterly. They couldn't believe that Steve had committed a crime. Steve was an experienced cop and quickly figured out what to do. He went to the trash heap, put on some old rags, rolled up in the mug 
and pretended to be a bomb. Seeing the smelly tramp, the police didn't even approach him. Searching for a place to hide, Steve went to his childhood place, where he used to play hide-and-seek with his friends. Looking for his former partner, Bob completely forgot about his main witness. Mark heard a knock and rushed under his bed, hoping that Tuk Tuk would not find him again. The sounds of a slammed trap and heavy footsteps resounded around the house. Apparently, the maniac was looking for the victim. The door to the room opened, and Mark saw two legs approaching. Tuk Tuk threw back the bat and appeared before Mark in full size. The maniac grabbed his victim, tied him up and dragged him into the street. Mark shouted and asked for help. A passerby tried to help him, but Tuk Tuk deftly blew his head off with a hammer. He put Mark in the trunk of his hearse and with a whistle of wheels disappeared in an unknown direction. Meanwhile, Bob was invited to the laboratory. The expert said that the fingerprints from the crime scene belonged to Grey Digger, who died recently. And the dirt from the maniac's boots coincided with the dirt from the cemetery where the Grey Digger worked. Bob was quite puzzled. He didn't know how it was even possible. Having gathered a squad of police, Bob went to search the abandoned cemetery. Tuk Tuk dragged Mark into his Christmas tree, smiling maliciously, said that Mark would not see the new year ever again. Mark asked him why he was doing this, but Tuk Tuk silently thrust the poor boy into the coffin, closed the lid and began to nail it down. Mark was begging him to stop, but Tuk Tuk mercilessly continued to hammer the rusty nails in. Having finished his dirty business, he lowered the coffin into the grave, threw the presents and began to bury them all together. The police, led by Bob, arrived to the cemetery. They saw a decorated Christmas tree and began to search for the missing teenagers, calling their names. Bob entered the house to examine it. He noticed a photo frame covered with dust on the wall, took it to investigate. But at that moment, a huge monster ran out of the cellar and rushed towards the forest. Together with another cop, Bob rushed after him. Tuk Tuk ran into the cave. The cops switched on their flashlights and followed him. They wandered around the catacombs for a long time, afraid of getting lost. Suddenly, cops heard a knock in the darkness and decided to come closer. It was Tuk Tuk. He was knocking on the support beam. With a powerful blow, he eventually broke it. Stones started falling from the ceiling, blocking the passage. Bob was glad. Tuk Tuk immured himself in the cave forever. Shouts of the police resounded from the cemetery. They found that the graze ground near the Christmas tree was still soft. Perhaps the missing children were underneath it. The cops started digging it and immediately came across the gifts. Coffins laid deeper. The teenagers were rescued. Bob told them that it was all over and the Tuk Tuk was gone. Soon, an ambulance and the reporters arrived. Everybody congratulated the teenagers on their salvation. Tuk Tuk wandered through the dark catacombs. Suddenly, he heard a sniffing. Approaching the sound, the maniac discovered his worst enemy, who was freezing from cold. Finally, Bob finished his damn duty and wanted to go shopping for the New Year gifts. But suddenly, he remembered about the photo from the maniac's house. He took it out and dusted it off. The photo showed a Tuk Tuk and his family. They seemed quite happy. The walkie-talkie beeped and the cop guarding the cemetery said that an emergency had happened. Bob immediately drove to the scene. The surviving policeman reported that he and his partner were patrolling the cemetery on schedule as usual when they suddenly noticed some silhouettes in the darkness. Coming closer, they found that Steve and Tuk Tuk dug out a grave together and pulled out a crazy granny. The cops asked them to surrender, but Tuk Tuk covered Steve with his body and waved his hand in threat. The cops had nothing to do but to fire, but Tuk Tuk didn't even feel the bullet piercing him. Instead, he grabbed the monument and threw it at one of the cops. The second policeman managed to survive. The fiends grabbed the granny and disappeared. Police officer Bob interrogated Tuk Tuk's family over the tea break in their cozy house. The maniac's wife couldn't believe that Fyodor was alive. 
she remembered him with hatred. When Guest 666 sect appeared in Roblox, they started killing local residents constantly. The cemetery flourished. Every day it was necessary to bury the murdered Robloxers, and the gravedigger made really good money. But then, Guest 666 sect was destroyed by the anti-Guest 666, and the cemetery went bankrupt. Fyodor could not support his family any longer. When the new year came, they didn't even have money to decorate the Christmas tree. His wife demanded gifts, but the gravedigger didn't know how to afford any. He was just sitting in the corner with his head bowed. The chimes woke him up exactly at midnight on the New Year's Eve, but no one was at home. Fyodor picked up a hammer and started knocking. Since then, no one had seen him. Bum said that Fyodor fell into the river. That's why the gravedigger was noted as dead. The polluted river was loaded with chemicals. Steve and Tuk Tuk threw Granny's corpse into the water and started waiting for something. Soon enough, Steve broke down and started yelling at the Walking Dead that his method of reviving wasn't working. When Tuk Tuk was locked in the catacombs, he met freezing Steve, who was hiding from police and wanted to kill him. But Steve knew another way out of the cave, and Tuk Tuk agreed to help him to revive the murdered granny for the sake of freedom. Mark's mom sent him to buy some milk. It was early morning, and he reluctantly wandered to the store. Walking across the bridge, Mark noticed some weird dudes. They ran along the bank and tried to pull something out of the water. Mark came closer and saw his acquaintances. They were trying to catch the crazy granny floating in the river. The frightened guy immediately called Officer Bob and reported about his meeting with the criminals. Tom was begging not to hurt his daddy, and the nasty mother was screaming to shoot him like a mad dog. A few minutes later, the police surrounded the certain area around the river. Steve desperately shook the granny's slim body, hoping for a miracle. Tuk Tuk kept saying that everything should work out. He was preventing the cops from coming closer. Bob suggested the criminals to surrender with no resistance. He shot Tuk Tuk his son, so the monster would not behave stupidly. Tom was screaming to his father to stop being bad, and even tried to get out of Bob's hands. Something happened in the maniac's soul. He threw himself into the water and swam away. Steve had no other choice than to surrender. The granny was brought into the ambulance and taken to the morgue. On the way there, the doctors were laughing about something and discussing the recent news on the TV. Suddenly, they heard someone singing. It was crazy granny. She opened her eyes and was singing a lullaby. She had a pair of spokes in her hands and she was needing something. Bob drove Steve to the police station. And on the way there, they saw an ambulance, which drove the granny away. The doors were flung open and no one was inside. Bob looked around and noticed the cocoons hanging in the trees. He pulled out a knife and cut the knitted fabric of the cocoon. He was shocked when he saw a doctor inside with his eyes and mouth soon up. Steve rushed out from the car and started begging Bob to save his family from this crazy granny, because most likely she would like to revenge. Bob took pity on his former partner and they agreed to catch the granny together. But after that, Steve would still be imprisoned. Steve's family was brought to the police station, in the witness protection room. Two big guys with shotguns guarded the entrance. Steve felt calm. Now his wife and daughter were protected. Tom and Mark were playing on their phones when Granny came into their room. She was singing some creepy song. Tom's mother was standing behind her, and her eyes looked super strange. Mark lifted her gaze at Tom and noticed that his friend's eyes changed as well. He rushed into the street searching for help. Mark saw a police car on the road and waved his hands happily. It turned out to be Steve and Bob. He told them about the incident at his friend's house. The officers realized that this crazy granny was hypnotizing the victims with her song and Mark was lucky to wear the headphones. They drove up to the Tuk Tuk's family house. Bob asked Granny not to kill anyone, but nobody answered. They rushed inside, but it was too late already. The Granny had disappeared, leaving behind the two cocoons hanging from the ceiling. 
Bob's radio hissed. Shots and the granny's singing resounded. For a moment, cops even got hypnotized. Apparently, granny attacked the police station. Mark was sent home. Steve found a couple of headphones, and they both rushed to rescue their families and colleagues. But unfortunately, they came too late. The station was full of cocoons hanging all over it. Steve was running from one murder to another, looking for his family. But fortunately, they were not among the killed ones. Perhaps they managed to escape through the emergency exit. Mark called Bob and told him that he had met Steve's family and that they all hid from Granny at his house. The cops rushed there. Steve hugged his family once again, but all of a sudden he grabbed his arm, falling to the floor. A sharp pain gripped his entire body. Bob took off Steve's jacket and saw that his arm was almost completely covered with infection. It was necessary to do something, and Bob asked Mark to heat a frying pan on the stove. Meanwhile, he went down to the basement. The cop found an old chainsaw there and started it, and abruptly sawed off the rotten part of Steve's arm. Mark burned the wound with a hot frying pan, and Steve passed out from pain. When he recovered, a surprise awaited him. The guys attached the chainsaw to his hand, taped it, and made him look like the main character from The Evil Dead. They saw Granny on the monitor. She wandered around the house and hummed her song. Everybody put on their headphones. Steve hid Mark and his family in the basement and together with Bob went out into the street to fight with crazy Granny. The old crone slowly approached them. Bob opened the fire, but she deftly dodged from bullets like Neo from the Matrix. Her deadly spokes reached Bob and the brave policeman fell to the ground. Steve started his chainsaw and swiftly took off the head of the ominous granny. Her head still continued to mutter and laugh though. Steve stepped on it with all his might and the green goose scattered across the asphalt. On New Year's Eve, local authorities decided to close the chemical plant and to swamp the poisoned river so that the new monsters could not appear in the area. Tuk Tuk dug his family out and almost dipped them into the contaminated water, but did not notice how a pile of the ground was poured on top of him.